हेलो एवरी वन टूडे वी विल टॉक अबाउट अ वेरी फेमस बुक द अनारकी रिटन बाई विलियम डर लेम्पल बेसिकली दिस बुक इज अबाउट द राइज ऑफ ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी एंड हाउ अ जॉइंट स्टॉक कंपनी रूल द सब कॉन्टिनेंट फॉर ओवर टू हंड्रेड ईयर्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वील डिस्कस अबाउट द ऑथर द नेम ऑफ द ऑथर इज विलियम डर लेम्पल ही इज दिल्ली बेस्ड कॉटिश हिस्टोरियन and he has written very famous books started his career by writing travel accounts later he started writing on history the main focus of his uh, books has always been the indian subcontinent uh, mainly the part uh, including the india and afghanistan following are some of his main and very famous books that are white moguls and the last mogul uh, the nine lives then return of a king then the writers i kohinoor and the anarchy you can understand that he has a very strong grip on the mogul history and the mogul empires and the history of subcontinent his one of the very famous books is kohinoor he wrote lot lots of thing about the most infamous diamond and then uh, the book that we have chosen to discuss today is the anarchy is it is basically the relentless rise of the east india company the book has been divided into 9 chapters and we will discuss the summary chapter wise the chapter number 1 is 1599 which is basically the time period when east india company was created as a joint stock company uh, it was created by a royal charter that was issued by queen elizabeth 1 and uh, it was passed in the british parliament and then in the the first british trade forces came to india in 1608 the man who led these trade forces in 1608 was captain william hawkins and it has been known and it has been mentioned in the book that captain william hawkins tried his best to meet jahangir but jahangir wasn't very willing to the, for this meeting but at last uh, captain william hawkins met with jahangir and they discussed some of the uh, usual things but uh, jahangir wasn't very much interested in the trade communication so captain william hawkins returned to british in a very kind of a dis- disappointed manner and he told the british parliament that the moguls didn't seem quite interesting in the trade however the stockholders of the company were very much willing to do trade with the moguls so they sent sir thomas roy as their next envoy to Uh, the indian subcontinent and he finally managed to met the emperor jahangir and they met in 1614 so thomas roy uh, talked a lot with jahangir and it has been mentioned in the book that jahangir wasn't very much interesting like roy was wanted to talk about the trade but jahangir was wanted to talk about uh, astronomy and arts so the the Uh, areas of interest and the focus were very different that's why it also didn't get much success however thomas roy uh, um, succeeded in convincing jahangir to uh, let him build a trading fortress in madras and then he built another one in bombay and another one in kolkata it has been known that the fortress that has been made in bombay just after a period of some years became a very commercial port and lots of people started trading there so it was the kind of a first success for the east india company on the other side the author discussed the era of mogul emperors it was the era of mogul emperor uh, aurangzeb he, he he has been very successful in his conquest that's why he started conquering the lands of the south indian portion of the indian subcontinent as you people may be aware that the moguls were uh, mainly concentrated in the northern part of the indian subcontinent but it was aurangzeb who started to go down he uh, went further down to dakkan in the south indian portion of the indian subcontinent in exchange of aurangzeb's uh, conquest there were many resistance movements by the states of bijapur and golconda and there were maratha guerrilla leaders who rose up for in the shape of the resistance movement one of the very famous maratha leader was shivaji bhonsle his name is very famous uh, in the shape of the resistance that marathas showed to show to the moguls and then uh, in 1707 mogul emperor aurangzeb died 
this is one of the very important point in the history of the subcontinent like that how moguls lost their glory and power because in 1707 mogul uh, emperor aurangzeb died and he didn't uh, announced any of his heir so there weren't any one to rule after him so in 1717 just in a year four different emperors occupied the peacock throne and uh, the um, mogul states were almost in the anarchy there weren't any um, competent leader to rule and people started losing their trust in the moguls so the uh, in result of this thing the people started uh, not giving revenues to the moguls and the mogul empire started to weaken however even at that time mushat kuli khan of bengal who was the governor of bengal uh, didn't stop paying revenues to the moguls and that's why his name is famous because he has been considered as a very harsh governor who was still so loyal to moguls that he he made very strict laws to collect revenue and then there is a famous character of jagat seth jagat these seths are the people who were very rich at that time and then the author discussed era of muhammad shah he is also known as muhammad shah rangila he is a mogul king and because of his uh, nature that was very uh, colorful and he was known as muhammad sharangila or the merry maker he was very much indulged in uh, kind of all the useless activities that's why he didn't pay much attention to his empire and in because of his ignorance so many people rose up to uh, re- uh, revolt against him one of them was baji rao he was also a maratha leader in 1737 he raided the outskirts of agra and looted all the things from agra then uh, at when mohammed shah came to know that baji rao has revolted he wrote letters to uh, his very famous generals one was nawab sadat khan and the other was nizam ul mulk uh, both of them were the veteran generals so they came to fight with baji rao but uh, surprisingly baji rao defeated the mogul generals and it was a very severe defeat because both of them were very much trained in their work however when these people were white fighting with each other in a shape of the civil war they didn't know that someone from outside is also going to attack delhi and the one person who attacked from outside and took benefit from the whole situation was nadir shah he was a persian king he was born in persian khorasan and in 1737 he also came to loot and looted delhi it has been written in the book and it has been mentioned when he was Uh, coming out from Isfahan Isfahan is a city in Iran when he is coming to Delhi he said to his people that he is going to pluck some golden feathers from the Mughal peacock throne this Mughal peacock throne is basically Jahangir's peacock throne and it has been very famous because it was a very precious throne and there was a Kohinoor embedded in the throne this is the same Kohinoor that you often see in the crown of queen Elizabeth II So this was basically a diamond that was initially in the peacock throne of Jahangir emperor. So when Nadir Shah came he looted on the Delhi and he killed lots of people uh, and uh, Nawab Sadat Khan and Nizam ul Mulk both were unable to stop him. So at the end Nizam ul Mulk surrendered and asked and begged Nadir Shah to go back and don't uh, kill their people. So in return Nadir Shah said that okay he will go back but in return he needs to they needs to give him 100 crore 1 billion at that time. so they agreed and they started looting people again to collect this much money but this time the looting wasn't by nadir shah it was by the mogul generals so in at the end they gave nadir shah all the money nadir shah took the peacock throne the kohinoor diamond and another very famous diamond known as darya noor which was the which was in pinkish color and also known as the sister of kohinoor diamond he took all of these thing with him and he took 700 elephants 4000 camels and 12000 horses and all these horses and all these things were carrying wagons all laden with gold so this was the scale that nadir shah uh, looted delhi and it has been known and it has also been mentioned in the book that the purpose of nadir shah to coming to the subcontinent was only looting he wasn't there to rule delhi because his main Uh, enemies were the uh, russians and the ottomans so in the next chapter which we are going to discuss is the, an offer he could not refuse it is basically about robert clive how robert clive came to rule india 
whenever you read the history of the indian subcontinent you will always come to know about a man that is robert clive who was the first governor general of uh, bengal and who basically won bengal for the east india company basically robert clive was the man who made east india company rule the indian subcontinent for 200 years at that time bengal was ruled by sirajud daula and there was a governor of fort william in calcutta his name was roger drake and in the meantime there was a scenario that france military troops were gathering in india france and britain has always been enemies of each other and france did want to win indian subcontinent for itself but the britishers didn't want it to happen so in the british parliament there were a meeting and they discussed that they had to stop the france so they decided to send robert clive and they asked robert clive if he is he is willing to go as the deputy governor of madras that's why the name of this chapter is an offer he could not refuse because robert clive wasn't going to uh, refuse to this offer he has always been a very violent child and his father didn't want him to stay in britain he wants him to go somewhere out so this was a golden chance for them and also for clive to uh, present himself as a warrior and a very intelligent man and so this happened so he came to indian subcontinent in the meantime roger drake was building walls around in calcutta uh, around the fort william and sirajud daula came to know about this in the next chapter we will discuss sweeping with the broom of plunder it is basically the story of sirajud daula uh, sirajud daula came to know about the walls of calcutta and he warned roger drake that he shouldn't be making walls around the calcutta but roger drake didn't take it much seriously and he kept on building the walls so sirajud daula took it uh, this thing uh, on his ego and he gathers his army of 70000 indian soldiers although he knew that roger drake has only 500 or 515 men with him but he went to the uh, calcutta and started a battle there uh, roger drake army had just 515 men so there wasn't any competition they lost very easily and the men of the sirajud daula looted the foreigners and the company and at the end they <coughs> gathered all the prisoners uh, almost 300 prisoners and they put them in a cell which had which was later named as black hole because there wasn't much uh, windows in the cell there was just a small window and all of the people died in the black hole while suffering for some oxygen and at the end uh, sirajud daula named calcutta as ali nagar because by faith sirajud daula was a shia muslim so he named uh, ali uh, calcutta as ali nagar on the name of imam ali then there is a very famous man that whose name was jannat said he was in the court of sirajud daula he was basically a financier and he was very rich so and he so that's why he has very much contacts and influence in the court of sirajud daula but he and sirajud daula didn't uh, go very much like they had some differences in between them so jannat said didn't like sirajud daula and same was the case with siraj so jannat said decided to conspire against sirajud daula he met with an iraqi general who was the general of sirajud daula's force his name was mir jafar and they both of them conspired against sirajud daula and they decided to go to robert clive robert clive was always willing to have such a opportunity so he readily agreed and all three of them uh, made an alliance and conspired against mir jafar in the very next year in 1757 uh, there was a battle which was named as battle of plasse it is one of the most famous battle in the history of bengal uh, basically this was the battle in which the britain won the bengal so in the battle of plasse sirajud daula lost because he because of the conspiracy of mir jafar and jannat said and robert clive and Uh, he died in, and his age was just 25 years there was also an incident of monsoon rain and sirajud daula's force couldn't keep their cannons dry so this rain also played an important role in the defeat of sirajud daula then mir jafar became the new nawab of bengal so jannat said and clive already had an agreement so in due to this agreement clive became the wealthiest man in europe and he went back to london in 1760 when clive went back to london in 1716 he had so much wealth and money with him that uh, no single man would ever has came to london with such a huge amount of money 
so he become very popular and famous because of his achievement and very also become a very reputable man and on the other side mir jafar became the emperor but mir jafar wasn't a very competent leader so people weren't very happy with him and people start to rebellion that's why the name of this chapter is a prince of little capacity because mir jafar was basically a puppet a puppet of robert clive and a puppet of general seth so then there is a very also a very famous war which is named as battle of helsa it was fought in 1761 and the main person who was in this battle was shah alam on the other side shah alam was out of delhi and he was wandering in the country here and there so he decided to go to bengal when he came to bengal people were already very much against against me jafar so they decided to ally with shah alam and then a war was fought between me jafar and shah alam a battle of helsa although shah alam lost the battle but he still managed to save his life and he ran away after the war the company also understood that people aren't very happy with the leadership of mir jafar so they decided to uh, install mir qasim in place of mir jafar mir qasim was the son in law of mir jafar so the company made mir qasim as the new nawab of bengal Although Mir Qasim was also installed by the company but he wasn't like his father-in-law he wasn't very much flexible to the britishers demand and the company also didn't listen to his demand Mir Qasim demanded a lots of thing from the company but the company didn't pay attention to his demands so in return Mir Qasim started thinking about the retaliation so Mir Qasim made an alliance with Shujaud Daula he was the governor of Awadh another province near Bengal and shah alam shah alam was also looking for an opportunity so all three made an alliance with each other then there is an important event that is siege of patna mir qasim and his forces attacked the employees of east india company and 50 of the europeans were killed in this siege Uh, so robert clive also got to know about it and all the east india company his employees were very much furious on this thing so in return they did another battle that was battle of bugzar uh, it was uh, fought by from the british side by hector munro it is also a very famous war uh, because britishers and east india company won this battle and it was such a, a big bloodshed that mir qasim had to flee flee for his life and shujaud daula decided to serve as company's puppet and shah alam formed an alliance with the company after siege of patna company's investors were also very much like furious because the stock has fell and lots of employees were killed so they decided to send back robert clive again robert clive came to the subcontinent and he made an agreement with the shah alam Shah Alam just wanted his throne back, but he wasn't capable of getting it back by him by his own self. So he just made an agreement with Clive. But and Clive also demanded Diwani from uh, Shah Alam. Diwani is basically a kind of a formal agreement that all the taxes and revenues will be uh, generated by East India Company, and East India Company is capable of uh, like. collecting as much tax and as much revenues as much as it wants so basically it was the start of the rule of east india company then there is another uh, famous chapter that is chapter number 7 wrecked by famine 1770 there was a disaster that was a two year drought and there were no rain for the agriculture so the uh, bengal province was stuck with famine the company couldn't con- uh, generate revenues by the agriculture because of famine so they decided to raise the taxes on layman and in result uh, it become it was so horrible that 1.2 million bengalis died due to starvation or disease then there is an important event of european final crisis crisis in 1772 and the company's stock fell more at that time the investors decided to uh, impeach lord clive because of his incompetence and they decided to question robert clive so robert clive did give them answers but he wasn't uh, very much able to justify himself so he just said leave my honor take away the fortunes it has been said that robert clive was known as lord virtue in the europe after this event and people started hating him so much he was so much uh, disheartened by all this that in 1774 he just did a suicide he cut his jugular vein uh, his maid saw him in the washroom and his throat was cut by himself so this is how a man who has been so treacherous 
and so cunning in all all his life and did his life in chapter number 8 the author narrated the desolation of delhi it was basically shah alam who allied with marathas because robert clive didn't succeed in getting him back to the throne so he had no option but to ally with marathas so the marathas promised shah alam that his throne will be back and they sent him to delhi and he really got his peak of throne back then there was a very famous man najaf khan he was in the court of uh, shah alam and he was a very uh, intelligent and competent general so he uh, drafted a strategy of winning back all the mogul lands that moguls had lost so he helped shah alam in regaining the lands and the revenues but in the meantime uh, people weren't happy the muslims weren't happy with the marathas alliance and the muslim scholars mainly the scholars like shah waliullah they weren't very happy with the marathas influence so he wrote a letter to ahmed shah abdali who was in the durrani dynasty in afghanistan and rukestro requested him to come to india and rule india so ahmed shah abdali did pay attention to shah waliullah's request and he came to delhi and then there was a fight that is third battle of panipat it was between ahmed shah abdali and the marathas leader but ahmed shah abdali won however even after winning the battle he didn't decide to rule the subcontinent instead he went back to afghanistan so the purpose wasn't served that shah waliullah wanted as a muslim dynasty or the muslim rule by ahmed shah abdali but shah alam got to know that najibuddaula from his court has been conspiring and he was in alliance with ahmed shah abdali so najibuddaula was killed and there was a son of najibuddaula whose name was zabita khan he fled and they left their a uh, family back in in the in delhi so shah alam took the revenge from his family and his family was imprisoned and his son zabita khan sons and najibuddaula's grandson whose name was gulam qadir he was adopted by shah alam gulam qadir was very handsome so there were rumors that shah alam and gulam qadir had a kind of a illegitimate relation however in 1782 najaf khan died and the planning and strategy of winning back the mogul lands also died with him and in 1788 gulam qadir took a revenge from shah alam he raped the household of shah alam and his army looted the court and in the end gulam qadir took out shah alam's eyes and blinded him so this was the most horrible uh, revenge that gulam qadir has taken in the next chapter we will discuss the impeachment of warren hasting warren hasting was also the first de facto governor general of india he was a nice man but he was impeached by the parliament in 1788 because the company's stock has fallen due to famine and the all the siege of patna and such kind of killings and because of european financial crisis so it people considered warren hasting the person responsible for all this although it wasn't warren hasting mistake but the people like philip francis has conspired against him and told the parliament and that it was his mistake so when hosting was impeached and the trial on him lasted for 7 years in the last chapter which is chapter number 9 the cops of india there was a uh, scenario discussing american revolution american revolution did take place in 1776 and britishers were very much disappointed on this so they didn't want the same to happen in india basically in american revolution the 13 colonies of britishers revolted in america so they decided to uh, invent some kind of laws that can stop the same thing happening in the indian subcontinent so they sent general conwallis who was also the main general in the american war of independence from the britisher side to india and there was a law by the east india company that is known as bald racist law it means that no person from the british and indian origin for example if someone has a parent from british origin and a parent from the indian origin they can't have any position in the east india company so this was basically east india company strategy to stop any kind of revolt in the uh, some of the last resistance that british east india company has faced in india was masoor resistance it was basically by hyder ali and his son tipu sultan they fought the first anglo, anglo masoor war and second and third and fourth basically there were four anglo masoor war and on one side there were east india company and on one side there were the masoor hyder sultan tipu sultan and the alliance with the french 
so basically britishers won all these uh, wars and in the fourth anglo messu wars in 1799 uh, tipu sultan died at the battle of seringapatam and with this uh, his death the messu resistance ended east india company crushed the messu resistance badly so after the news of tipu's death it has been said that velisle he was he came after general con velis he raised his glass and said i drink to the corpse of india because they were very much clear that now nobody was left to fight against them very last resistance movement that east india company faced was from marathas and it was in the shape of the battle of assai and battle of delhi it was in 1803 but in 1800 there was a death of the maratha politician whose name was nana padnavis he was a very competent and a kind of a cunning politician he was also known as uh, marathas machiavelli but his death made britishers sure that nobody is able to fight them and that's why in the end marathas also made an alliance with the east india company and shah alam also made an alliance with the east india company so uh, on the other side in the british parliament it has been noticed that the uh, east india company has manipulating and exploiting the people of uh, india very much so they decided to look after the company's role and in 1813 the company's trade monopoly over india was lifted so it means that now more companies and more uh, countries can be able to uh, start their trade in the indian subcontinent so in in 1857 which is known as the war of independence so many indian rebels were killed by the company and that's why the parliament decided to dispel the company's private army and the navy and then all the company's territories were given to british and from 1857 there was a charter uh, in 1858 and according to that charter queen victoria became the ruler of the india as the empress of india and the company's contract just expired in 1874 So here we end our summary of this book the anarchy it is a bit bit lengthy book that's why its summary took so much time and basically it is a history of 200 years that how a joint stock company managed to rule the indian subcontinent for such a long time period and they also managed to take so much advantage from the its india So let's end our discussion here. If you like this summary and or want to know more summaries about such complicated books, then do comment the name of that book and also tell how was the summary. Did you like it? Thank you.